Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this presentation that has nothing to do with Plone. I'm glad you decided to make the choice to branch out a little bit. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. I'm DB. I'm a web developer in the Boston area. I'm huge on open source, and I'm a core committer on the Lecter project, which I'll be telling you more about in this presentation. I work in Python and JavaScript, and if you happen to need a contractor, I'm available. So shameless plug. So the reason I'm here is I want to talk to you about the web. And specifically, I want to talk to you about different ways that you can construct a website. Broadly, there are two different kinds of websites. There's dynamic websites and there's static websites. Most of us who are contractors or developers building websites, building complex large websites, are used to dynamic websites. And static sites tend to sort of get brushed off and forgotten about because to understand what they are, we have to go way, way back, all the way back to the 90s. Anyone remember these websites? <laughs> so GeoCities and AngelFire were some of those most popular static, websites ho static website hosts back when the web was getting popular. And this was before dynamic websites really existed. So the idea with a static website is you write your HTML files, you upload those files to the web server, and then when people come and visit the web server to see your website, the server just sends those files directly out to the visitor without any sort of processing involved. It's very simple. It's also not very powerful. So you can't make any sort of changes to the HTML of your website before it gets sent out. So for example, when some script kiddies decided that they wanted to make their website more dynamic and interactive by displaying the current date and time, they discovered that they couldn't do that easily. This was before people started using JavaScript in earnest and in depth the way that people have started to do today. So they, uh, they started finding ways to make dynamic websites. So a dynamic website is a website where you upload a piece of code to the web server, and that code executes to create an HTML file. And every time someone visits the server, the server has to re-execute that code to get the HTML file, which gets sent out to the person visiting the site. Now, all of a sudden, the, the code that you write that generates your website can have dynamic statements in it, such as drop the current date and time onto the page, which is great. And as soon as people started realizing that they could get some of these interesting dynamic features, they wanted more. So I want a guest book on my website. I want my website to send emails to the people who come and visit it. I want to create a web ring and do all sorts of crazy 90s things. <laughs> so dynamic sites started getting a little bit more popular. And now you might have a website that queries a database, or sends email, or even makes API calls to other websites out on the internet. However, the cost of doing all of that is things on a dynamic website start to get slower and they start to get more expensive as well. So the traditional way of solving this is to use a cache layer. You have some sort of memcache or Redis layer in front of your dynamic website, and when a visitor comes in, they try to, the, it checks the cache first to see if it can avoid doing all of that expensive work. And if it can, it just sends the resulting HTML files right back to the client just as though it was a static site. Now the problem is that, as you can see from this diagram, things are getting pretty complex. And we've gone forward a couple of years now from the 90s into the 2000s. And people are starting to realize that they need some standardized tooling to man manage all of this complexity. And that's when the, ri the rise of the CMS started. And I'm sure you've all seen these logos before. WordPress, Drupal, Plone, Joomla, Wagtail, and lots more CMSs that I'm not that, that aren't listed here. These are just some of the biggest that I know about. And the whole reason why CMSs exist is because dynamic websites are so large and so difficult to make changes on in a consistent way that you need a framework to manage that complexity and to help average users and people who just want to get it up and running quickly to get to the point where they can be productive quickly and easily. So, We've talked about dynamic sites, and there's a lot of different pros and cons to weigh between them. They allow you to have lots of features that static websites just don't have, such as interactivity, creating users that can interact with other users, posting comments, that sort of thing, 
an admin site where admins can log in and create content, writing blog posts. And it's relatively simple for people who are not very technical to use that admin site to create content. But it's much more complicated. You get potential security vulnerabilities. It seems like WordPress comes out with a new security vulnerability every month. And scaling issues can get very expensive once your website starts getting popular. On top of all of this, you probably are going to get occasional downtime, whether that downtime is from doing server upgrades or from getting hacked or from provisioning more servers to increase capacity, or simply because you didn't increase your capacity and now you're over capacity and some of these users aren't getting the website that they, ex that they expected to get. So now, as we move forward in time, we get the rise of JavaScript. JavaScript execution environments in the browser get much faster and we start seeing some of these front-end frameworks like Backbone, Angular, and React, which is so hot right now. And you start seeing single page applications that communicate with the server via JSON APIs rather than via HTML. So people started realizing if you can manage all the complexity of having a multi-page website on the front end and keeping it as an actual single page website on the back end, maybe all of this dynamic website complexity and architecture is overcomplicated. Maybe you don't need it at all. And the trend started to swing back the other direction to say maybe all you need is a static website that holds HTML and JavaScript, which is then directly served to the client. And then that JavaScript can build an interactive single page application that can do just about everything that you would need your dynamic website to do. So let's go over some of the pros and cons of static websites as well. They're much simpler to build and reason about. They're super cheap to run, and they're incredibly scalable. You're not going to run out of capacity if you're using something like Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage. And in addition, they're effectively impervious to security issues. There's nothing to hack. There's no way to do SQL injection when there's no database. It's simple enough that it's hardened and that you can't have a hacker come in and steal private information when there's really no private information to steal. Now, of course, we have the same cons that we had back in the 90s, which is to say trying to manage and update a static website is tedious and error prone. There's no dynamic content and there's no admin website. So non-technical users find it almost impossible to update content on a website. However, I want to see if we can combine some of these pros together across both of those. And the first one that I want to focus on is how cheap static websites are. How cheap are we talking about here? Let me give you an example. Let's say you have a popular website that consistently gets 100 page requests per second, every single second. You know, maybe wavering up and down a little bit, but that's the baseline. If you were to run that as a dynamic website, that would be incredibly expensive to provision all the servers that you need, dealing with databases, backups, caching, security, penetration tests, the whole nine yards. What if we just hosted it on Amazon S3? I did a bit of a calculations here, and the end result is a website that gets 100 hits per second is going to cost you about $100 a month, which is probably two orders of magnitude less than for a dynamic website of the same capacity. That's pretty astoundingly cheap. So with that being said, how can we get that sort of price while still getting the features that we need to have from a dynamic website? This is the basic question. Can we get the best of both worlds? So the limitations of a static website can basically be cut down to three categories. Updating is tedious and difficult. There's no dynamic content. And there's no admin site, so non-technical users can't create content easily. So the first bullet point is actually pretty straightforward to solve. Anytime you're dealing with updating the same content over and over again, you want to avoid repeating yourself. And when you're dealing with the front end, that means using a template. So you could use client-side templates in JavaScript if you want to. But some of us here tend to like Python. So I tend to prefer writing my templates on the server side in a templating language that runs in Python. So for that, you can use preprocessor templates. And while I like Python, other people might like other languages instead, it doesn't matter. You don't have to use JavaScript if you don't want to. 
But the idea of, a, of templates is that you have your code, it takes information, and it renders the HTML. Dynamic websites use dynamic templates, which render the template once for every request. A preprocessor uh, preprocessor template will render the template once to get a set of HTML files, and then upload those HTML files to the server. The server will then take those HTML files and serve them out as a static website, just the same as it would any other website. And the benefit of doing it this way is now, let's say you want to add, a, let's say you want to modify the footer across every single page of your website. And your website might have 500, 1,000, 2,000 pages in it, maybe an unknown number of pages in it. If you were dealing with a normal static website, trying to update all of that by hand is really hard. But fortunately, with a template, you can just use a static site generator. A static site generator is sort of like a dynamic website framework that only exists before you upload your HTML files to the server. So these are some examples of static site generators that have become fairly popular these days. Probably the best known is Jekyll. If you've ever used GitHub pages for a personal website or a project website, that actually uses Jekyll in the back end. So you can write your templates using Ruby syntax, and GitHub pages will compile it to HTML before it takes those files and sticks it on the web server. But in addition, there's Hexo, which is written in Node, Pelican, which is in Python, Hugo, which is written in Go, and all of these different languages have probably a dozen or two dozen different templating systems to choose from. These are just some of the most popular. So the idea with a static site generator is you define templates for your pages, you make one change to re-render your entire site, all 500 or 1,000 pages in one change of your template, and then you just take the resulting HTML and you upload it to the server overwriting your old files, and bam, you've just updated your entire site without needing a dynamic framework. This also means that you can work with CSS preprocessors, such as SAS or LESS, or you can use with some of the fancy newfangled JavaScript preprocessors as well, like Webpack, if you can wrap your head around its complexity. So first bullet point done. We can update multiple pages without it being tedious and error prone. The next bullet point is a lot more difficult. <coughs> There's no dynamic content for users. How are you going to take a static website and make it dynamic? Well, the good news is we can actually reframe the question a little bit. You may not actually need dynamic content if what you actually want is dynamic services. So the difference here, how many people actually run analytics on their website? Most people don't run analytics in-house. Most people use Google Analytics or some other similar service that is run by a third party. And the way that that analytics happens is that you, the customer, get a JavaScript tag from the service that you're buying your analytics from and plop that JavaScript tag on your web page. Then the information about who's visiting your site doesn't go to you. It goes to the company who you're paying to get that information for. Or if it's Google Analytics, it's free, but it's the same concept. You never handle that data. You can still get the information you need. You can still get the analytics that you're looking for and get the benefit, but you don't have to run all that service yourself. So dynamic services aren't just for analytics. There have been a huge outcropping of new services, new service providers that will give you content that has traditionally been reserved for dynamic content running as a dynamic service. One example is comments. If you want to run a simple blog and you want to have content on your blog, the only dynamic content that most people really care about for a blog is allowing users to sign in and post comments. There's this wonderful site called Discuss, which is actually run on Django, and it allows you to take a JavaScript snippet, drop it on your page, and it will provide a fully functional commenting system on your blog. This is an example of some comments that I have on my personal website organized by Discuss. What if you want a mailing list? MailChimp allows you to sign up on the MailChimp website, create a form, drop the, drop the information in a form tag on your website, and then when someone fills out their email address and hits the subscribe button, it doesn't actually go to my website. It goes over to MailChimp. They sign up directly on MailChimp's website, and then I can manage my own mailing list by going through MailChimp. I don't need to run it in-house. 
What if you have a more complex form, like a contact me link? Well, you can use a website called Wufu. Wufu is designed to build complex forms for you. And they have an interactive what you see is what you get editor to just pull in content and reorganize it how you want. But they process all of the back end for you as well. So this contact form on my personal website is serviced by Wufu. I just have the form on my static website. And when people fill out the content and click send message, it gets sent over to Wufu. Wufu handles all the validation, makes sure that the content is correct. If it isn't, then the user gets bounced to a page hosted on Wufu that allows them to correct their errors and try again. And then once it's correct, Wufu will actually take that content and send an email to my personal address. So once again, I get the service without having to host it myself. Search is one that I haven't used myself, but there's a startup called Algolia, which is designed to do dynamic services for search. You can have your static website load up all of the content across all of your pages, ship it off to Algolia, and Algolia will build a search index for you and allow you to query that index using RESTful APIs. So you can write a JavaScript search box on your site that anytime the user starts typing in some content, queries Algolia, which has the index of your website in it, and will allow you to get the search results that you need just like that. Again, not something you need to run in-house. What if you want full user accounts? What if you want people to sign up and to be able to manage arbitrary data for them? There's another startup called Stormpath that is trying to handle authentication for you. And they integrate both on the back end and on the front end. You can make RESTful API calls to say, I want to log in as this user because the user has given me this password in JavaScript. And then once I'm logged in, I get a token and I can use that token to make requests that are authenticated to set and retrieve any arbitrary data, data that you want. So even the whole authentication and user model that is so core to the idea of a dynamic website can be shipped off to an external service. And of course, there are many, many other APIs that you can use. If you want people to upload files, you can use Dropbox, Google Drive, or Amazon S3. If people want to go shopping on your website, you can use the Stripe.js API. There's Facebook and Twitter. There's Google AdSense for monetizing your website. And of course, if you don't find the thing that you want that's run by another company, you can just build it yourself. This is really what the whole microservices idea is all about. It's saying, can I take this small piece of dynamic content and ship it off to other people? So we've gone through dynamic content for users as well. And the last part is probably the most difficult because there's certainly services that allow you to get dynamic content via services. Or that was redundant, but you know what I mean. But to date, there hasn't been a static site framework that gives you the admin site that non-technical users so desperately need. Because most people don't want to write in HTML, and that's fine. They shouldn't have to. However, the thing that I wanted to tell you about, the thing that made me super excited when I found out about it, is Lecter, which is a static site CMS. And you look at that and you say, what the fuck does that actually mean? <laughs> like That seems like a contradiction in terms. I don't understand. What it means is it's a static site generator that also runs on the local computer a dynamic admin website. The admin website is not run on the server. It's run locally on your computer. Let me give you a, deep, uh, a brief overview on how Lecter works in the architecture. Lecter can basically divided, be divided up into three different components. There's your models, content, and templates. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the structure because it's what every dynamic website uses as well. These are all defined in flat files on your computer. There's no database. So this is an example of a model. This model is called page, and it has two fields in it, a title field and a body field. I want you to notice at the very bottom that the body field is set of type markdown. I'll come back to that later. In the contents file, I can create a contents.lr file. LR is just a special, a special file extension that the author of Lecter dreamed up um, that is a simple key value match between fields and the contents of those fields. And you can see that the body is a markdown formatted string. And then you have your templates, which are Jinja2 HTML templates, or not even necessarily HTML. You can use whatever you want in these templates. 
And here I'm referencing this.title and this.body, where this is the context of this page object that I'm rendering on this page. And when you render it, it all comes out exactly the way you'd expect. And because the body field has been specified to be the, of the markdown type, it'll automatically render that markdown for you. So that's like maybe a third of the way that we need. People can actually write in Markdown now instead of writing in HTML, which is a lot more user friendly. But the magic happens when you run Lecture Server on your computer. And when you run Lecture Server, you're going to get an interface that looks kind of like this. It'll actually run a web server locally on your computer that allows you to view, edit, and create new content directly from your web browser. So I have here a couple of screenshots showing what happens if I edit this page and then click Save Changes, and it'll actually show me a different version right there on the site. But I think I'm actually going to be a little bit adventurous. Oh, and there's one other thing. That button up there, that is the Publish button. So someone editing this website locally can then click the Publish button and it'll get sent automatically to whatever hosting provider they're using because it's all been pre-configured on the back end. So let me actually give you a live demo of how this works. And I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that it works out. Uh, all right, where? Ha! I may need to get rid of this thing. All right, so I'm going to run Lecter Quick Start. And it's going to ask me a couple of questions. I'll say I'm going to call this project PlumConf. And it already has my name because of Git. And I'll say, sure, it can just go to my home directory. Do I want a blog? Yes, why not? Like a latte. All right, and now I can go into PlumConf. And here's my files with the content, templates, and models directories, along with assets for other things like images and CSS files. Let me do lecter build, and that will produce HTML files as well as the static files that I've defined in my, in my assets. So that is a standard feature of any static site generator. But here's the thing that I think is really interesting. If I run lecter server and then visit this, in my web browser and drag my web browser over to where you all can see it. Here is the website. And in a new tab, I'm going to open all of this in a text editor as well so that you can see all of these files that have been generated. So, for example, content here. Here is the same content in a file that exists over here on this page. Now, the dynamic part is what happens when I click this little edit button over here. I get this editing interface. Now, let's say I want to say, hello, PlumConf. Save changes. And there it is. And if I go back to my file, it's been automatically updated. Because there's no database here. It's just using the file system as a database. I can even add new pages to my site as well. So I'll say, this is a sample. If I could spell, it would help. So now I have a totally new page that's been built out based on this template. And if I go to my contact section, there's this is a sample, and there's the same content that I just defined before. So this is allowing non-technical users to create, edit, update, and delete content the same way that you'd be able to with a, dynam a dynamic website, but you get all the benefits of a static website as well. And because all of the data is maintained in flat files, you can also version it. You can stick the entire website in version control and track every single change that's made over time. In fact, my personal website, davidbomgold.com, is a site that's built entirely on top of Lecter. 
And if you want to, you can go to my GitHub and see the entire project that will generate my personal website. There's all my templates for all the different types of pages that I have. There's the contents. Uh, where is it? Content. Uh, I can go to my blog, and you can see every blog post that I've done all in here. And I can go to my website, and here's that same blog post rendered on my site. My site isn't very fancy looking, and that's intentional because I care a little bit more about the back end than the front end. But this is all HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You can make it as swanky as you want. And in fact, the Lecter documentation website is, of course, also built with Lecter and has a lot of content in there. And every page has a comment section at the bottom powered by Discuss. It has a chat window that's powered by Gitter so that you can talk with other developers who are using this technology. Um, it has a lot of cool stuff in there. And there's a showcase of other people using this technology as well. Lecter is still fairly young. It's only been created in the last, I want to say, six months to a year or so. So the ecosystem is still pretty small. But I'm really excited about what it represents and what it's going to allow people to do in terms of building really interesting, really powerful sites that don't have to cost very much money. And that can be saved, versioned, and maintained using any sort of files version control system that you want. So let me go back to my presentation, which, where's my mouse? Here, mouse. There you go. So that's basically everything that I've got. Um, if you want to check out Lecter yourself, the website is getlector.org, as I just showed you. I'm David Baumgold. I'm singing Wolfboy on Twitter as well as on GitHub. If you want a copy of these slides, they're right there on that URL that's available. And I'm happy to take questions. I have a microphone so that when this is recorded for the video, you'll be able to be on there as well. Okay, so I've been uh, playing with Lecto. Mm -hmm. It was an early release, and I really liked it. But back then, what really uh, was missing for me was uh, incremental builds. I have a blog with more than 200 posts, and with Jenkill, it Jenkill took over three minutes every time I changed something small. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what's the status now with Lector. So the status of that is that the guy who wrote this project, his name is Armin Ronashar, and he has a lot of open source projects. He's the same guy who wrote Flask. And he's been rather busy in the past few months and hasn't given Lecter the attention that it really needs and deserves. However, I'm actually the other half of the development team. I volunteered to help bring Lecter to Python 3 compatibility. And I just contacted Armin literally two days ago to say, hey, I'd really like to see this project get moving forward faster. Are you OK with me being the primary developer? And he said, sure, I don't have time for it. So what that means is even though the project has been fairly stagnant for the past few months, I'm really looking forward to going through there, cleaning out the old GitHub issues, finding the pull requests that need to get merged, and merging them, and improving the project in the ways that people need, such as providing incremental builds. So at this point, the problem you're talking about still does exist. But I really want to make the project more powerful and to provide the features that people are looking for. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cool. Anyone else? When, when, when would be a good time to not use Lecter? So Lecter is great for anything that can be easily done as a static website. And as I've said, you can take dynamic content and pull them out into services. But doing so comes with all the caveats of any other microservice architecture, which is to say you have to manage all of those other services. You have to make sure that they work well together. And if one of them goes down, then it might affect other things on your site as well. So if you want to build a website that is really based on dynamic functionality at its core, such as something like Twitter or Facebook or something like that, something where 
user, user interaction with other users is the core principle behind your website, it's probably not a good idea to try to build it as a static website, just because it's a bit of an impedance mismatch. There are lots of websites, however, that don't have that sort of functionality at its core. Anything that's designed as a show-off or showcase, any sort of marketing website, any sort of blog, anything that is updated infrequently and that is not based on users posting content, that's going to be a great use case to use Lecture. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, well, I guess I'll let you out early. 